in person and those of you are joining online will also be able to take part uh, because um, Ben and Fran uh, in QA group are going to be using Miro and um, uh, VBOX um, to the participants remotely and also for yourselves uh, in person here. Um, the session is uh, on uh, the <laughs> what about me? Universal design for learning, foster inclusion by learning. By way of show of hands, how many people have heard of universal design for learning? Okay, oh, quite a few. Good stuff. Great. Cool. Um, that's just a um, point. So, um, to hand over to, to Fran and to Ben. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, I need to pop out, I need to take a call. Um, so, I might be back, but I'm not. I'll see you guys later at the um, um, the event. Um, and uh, yeah, see you later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, welcome start. everyone. Um, great to have you here. I'm hoping we'll we'll explain at the beginning what we're going to do, but we're hoping we give you a session a little something a little bit different for the next hour, something participatory and something you'll be involved in. Um, almost put you back in the learner's shoes for an hour, or maybe the first half hour of the hour. So, um, uh, so without spoiling the reveal, that's that's the hope for today. And I, I you know, it's a session we've done. Uh, internally uh, at our place before and it's gone well. So hopefully two out of two. Um, so we'll just introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Ben Sweetman. I'm Director for Content and Learning Design at QA. Um, QA is a commercial training business. Uh, we generally train technical people to do technical things across a really diverse range of different learning types, including higher education, apprenticeships, short courses, fully online is a real variety of what we do um, and it's part of the reason why universal design for learning has kind of been really interesting to us because we've got such a wide variety of different audiences uh, and different objectives so uh, that's me this is okay. Fran and I'm Fran Harrison I work in Ben's team I joined almost exactly four years ago as a learning technologist having you having done a business case that we needed one uh, four years down the line, I now lead a team, including myself, seven learning technologists who never have time to draw breath because <laughs> we're just constantly doing something new, aren't we, all the time? As soon as something's finished, the next new big thing comes along. So, yeah, it's good fun. It certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we, um, what we want to do is start with the housekeeping and then we'll intro the section. So, um, I'm going to, I'll drive the slides and Fran okay. can tell you what to do. Right. We're doing oh, a no. session that's in, supposed to be inclusive, oh. that's supposed to be universal, I've already done it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, in the spirit of that, we work a lot using um, digital whiteboards. So we've created a Miro digital whiteboard that we'll be using for the session. And we'll be taking questions, particularly for online people, We'll accept questions from in the room, but mainly for obviously online people. We don't want you to be left out. So any questions you have at all or any inputs, particularly for online people during the session where we ask a question, please drop them into the VVOX Q&A and whoever's not actually speaking will pick those up so that you've got an equal voice as much as we can manage. Is there anybody who in the room particularly is going to struggle to get into the Miro board for any reason? because we do have a backup if we need it. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Just in case, I mean, Miro is going to be by far the easiest experience because it's where the majority of people will be. If by any chance, particularly anybody online who's got Miro filtered on their network or something, we do have a backup Padlet board. It's built by me, not our graphics team, so it's not as good, I'm afraid, but it will enable you to take part and have a, have a voice in the session. But yeah, if you can use Miro, please do, because we'll be working on that for the majority of the session. Okay. I think that's everything, isn't it? There you go. Right, so what are you doing tech setup? Okay, <laughs> right. So, um, see there are a few, few hands went up around, uh, sorry. And a few, well, a few hands went up saying that you uh, were aware of universal design for learning. Um, 
So maybe first question is uh, both on VVox and in the room is what does inclusion and exclusion kind of mean for you as learning technologists and other similar digital roles and how do you experience it in your institution with your learners currently? How's it framed as well? So I'm now struggling as well. There we go. All inputs welcome. It's still on the so, slides. Yeah. The slides down. Are the slides still up? Are they? I will accept voice also as an input. Voice text, they're all welcome. Let's get back into that one. Minimize that one. Is that still not showing, is it? Yeah, I think we just pull the slides down completely from. There we go. Is that better? There, there we, we go. go. That's better. So yeah, post so, it, yeah. VVox, or For voice anybody, in the room, yeah. all welcome. For anybody that's not used Miro before, I expect most of us have, but just in case anybody hasn't, there's a little folded over square up here. If you tap on that, it will create a virtual post-it note, which you can then add here for that session. You've done inclusion. Yeah. And come into the, yeah, yeah. There. Real. So just as everyone's getting those in, I'm just going to keep going if you want to keep adding things. Um, I'll just say a little bit about why universal design for learning has resonated with us and why we think it's really helpful. Is I think previously, I think that a lot of the discussion around inclusion and accessibility was actually uh, ended up being um, a disability model, which is it was only considered for those people who had a particular disability that we then put in place alternatives for them. What we love about universal design for learning is it's much broader and actually it's the best framework we've seen that genuinely helps you think about the whole learning experience for everyone, not just viewing accessibility through a kind of, like I said, that narrow frame. And, and the key thing when we think about universal design for learning is it's the three the three kind of main pillars of it are, one is how do you engage people at the beginning? Um, how do you, particularly for us, a lot of that for us is about removing barriers to entry. So particularly a, a good example for us would be apprenticeships, where actually we actively want to remove barriers to people getting into an industry by making apprenticeships as accessible as possible. And so some of those can be very straightforward things like qualification entry requirements. That's that's one part. We can go, how can we make it easier that way? But another part is then thinking about um, if you want to get people into technology, we want to make the interview process less reliant. What we found is lots of people got asked technical questions in an interview question to be an apprentice where they, by their very definition, didn't have any technical background. And so in the early stages of a process, it starts to go that and almost gets us outside of just learning. It also works for us inside learning. So a good example, optional modules is, is how do you actually make the effort to give people more information about what optional modules to choose in a course and why? Um, again, being really disciplined about removing prereqs with it between courses that can accidentally force a student or a learner to, to close their close an option down. So that's kind of the first bit of UDL. The middle bit is the bit about actually, in a sense, content. Um, and without going to all the detail for us, you know, the key bit there is, again, not, this is where it's not just about the basic minimums. It's thinking about plain English for everyone, moving beyond just an alternative to actually how do you get, allow people to support preferences for how they want to consume content, actually, and, and this is one of the great opportunities potentially for AI that we're starting to see is how can you actually just allow the learner the control to go, I want to consume this as text or as video or as audio on the fly, you know, early days for that, but that's the sort of pace. And, and definitely 
the prevalence of plain jargon-free English throughout all of our tone of voice. Everything we write is real focus now on plain English, writing in the simplest way possible, particularly for technical content. And I'm sure in universities, the same. there's lots of subject matter that can get very jargon heavy. So that's the middle for us in representation. And the final one is, it's called action and expression, but it's particularly around assessment, which we'll talk about, is giving choice in assessment. And definitely in most academic so as we do have quite a lot of choice. We just tend to narrow it down for learners at the point of a module descriptor. And actually the, the discipline and the, um, the design stage for us is what we've really started to look at is how can we open choice up that means that we can assess people on their skills and their knowledge, not on how well they use the particular medium. And so those are the three kind of key pillars of this. Um, hello. Few only. Right, let's have a go. How do we do that, Fran? Oh, okay. Anyone with a link can view is the one that we need to change. It's the third one. That's it. There yeah, you go. Brilliant. All right. Try again. It always was a bit ambitious Thank this you. session, wasn't it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So that's the intro. Yep. So it's one eight, I think. Just give you a couple of moments, and and um, actually, I, whilst whilst you're doing this, I'll say something, and then I will leave. I will leave the room quiet for a minute. It's one of the things we found when we started really adopting Miro. Um, we, as I've already heard, early in lockdown, we started adopting Miro massively in classes, and actually, it had a real inclusion benefit for us because we found when you used to do breakout sessions in our classrooms. Uh, in the nicest possible way, the gobby ones dominated. Even if it was a post-it note sessions, the people who talk a lot tended to dominate the sessions. And then what we found is we moved to Miro and we went, we, we went to quite a lot of this. We went to silent brainstorming and silent exercises. And suddenly we got this much more, much broader participation in the exercises because actually we found loads of people were really happy, particularly our audience with lots of technical people were really happy writing, writing to contribute much more so than they were to, to, to actually speak. And particularly in our, most of our sessions are made up of people who don't know each other. They meet each other literally on the Monday morning of a course. And so it has that kind of social awkwardness thing in it. Um, and we found it broke that down really much better than that. So, right. And see things starting to go in. A like oh. sense of belonging. It's bigger, one we sometimes that. forget, isn't it? That it's not just about giving people access to stuff, it's about people feeling that they actually belong in the session as well. Hey, I'll just read some out for the, anyone who can't. So we've got equal access and opportunities, actively including marginalized group. Uh, if anyone wants to make their post-its a little bigger, that would help me. <laughs> Equity focus, there you go, thank you. Um, enabling success throughout the journey and you see yourself represented. So I think it's a really nice there. Um, and that's a good place for us to start from, I think. Okay. Right, give me a second because I forgot to do one thing, didn't I? Right. So I'm going to move on to this one. This came from a long and bizarre conversation, didn't it? This activity. <laughs> we were saying, how can we, with our team, not tell them about UDL, tell them what about the website? Because you can do that yourselves, quite to be honest. What we wanted to do was how often do we actually give ourselves time to stop completely all the emails, all the team's messages, and to step back and go, okay, we're trying to do this because we know it's important, 
why? Why do we need to do this? Why is it important? Why does the learner need us to do this for them? So we decided to do it experientially, really, didn't we? Yeah. Which is stop everybody. Right. If you want to know how your learners feel, we're going to put you in the learner's shoes. So for this activity, I do hope this works. We are amongst learning technologies, so you, I hope you'll forgive me if this doesn't work first time. But um, I'm actually going to show you a video and tell you a bit of a story because I am notorious for telling stories. You will have seen on your Miro boards that there is a picture of the Oculus, courtesy of our amazingly talented graphics department. And I'd like to emphasize before we start, just for health and safety reasons, this is a story. Do not rush out of the building to take part in this. The story is, Billy Smith is about to be, or has just been sworn in as the new CEO of OUT. And he was feeling really generous last night. So he decided that he was so excited about becoming CEO that he was going to give away a prize. And the prize is a lifetime's free access to the OUT Sea conference for yourself and for a friend. All you have to do is find the envelope that contains the voucher to give you that free access. The voucher is on top of the Oculus building. So you have to climb the Oculus building to get to it. So this is why you all have rope on your table. And I, I hope the online participants, if you haven't pick up something, you can tie knots in and that sort of thing, because that is the reason for the rope in case anybody was wondering. Shoelace. Shoelaces, lanyard. Just temporarily yeah, just remove them. anything. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Don't try and walk without shoelaces. So what we're going to do is I'd like you to take a piece of rope. You have a bit of choice if you're in room because I'd like to give people choice if I can. If you would like to work in pairs, feel free to speak to the person next to you who think that would be better. I have laundered all these, I will say, just for health and safety reasons. They've been through the wash. And what we're going to do, I'd like you to look at our Oculus building. You'll see it has lots of people below it. I'd like you to pick one of your people. And if you tap on the name where it says name below the person, put your name in there. It doesn't have to be your own name if you want to be confidential but claim one of the people, and that's your person for this session. Right, no. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to, to claim somebody. Remember where your person is, because there are quite a few there. The video up now. Yes. I'm going to work on the basis that we're vaguely ready. One moment. Oh, get an advert, of course. Oh, the advert. Oh, wonderful. Let's skip the advert. It isn't. Uh, one moment. There we go. Right. If everybody's claimed something, the knot you need to do, we've got pulleys outside the building. They're all ready. There are people ready to haul you up the building. So no matter your mobility issues, no matter anything, all you have to do is attach yourself to one of the carabiners, one of the pulleys outside the building. Then somebody will haul you up so you can start searching. For that, you need to tie a knot called a bowline. Does anybody know how to tie a bowline already? Have I got any sailors or any climbers in the room? Or I can't ask online, but you have an added advantage that I don't know you already know this. I should add that I am terrible at knots and I've done this twice and still can't do it. I should add <laughs> that I can vouch for that. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a video of how to tie the knot. When you've tied your knot after the video, move your little person to the top of the oculus to show me that you have managed to tie yourself to the ropes and somebody has managed to pull you to the top of the oculus so that you can be part of the party that searches for the prize. Are you ready? 
How are you doing? <laughs> ben is going to demonstrate his knot first. <laughs> Every time. How did you get on with that? How did? I think I couldn't understand much of it in Korean. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to listen. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple of knots. This this is better than our team. Can we employ some of these people? Knots. Fast learners. I've got one or two people that have managed to tie a knot that should look. Hang on. I'm doing, I can't believe I'm doing this live on the live stream. That should look like that. So you should have something that looks roughly like that. If you've watched, if you've watched Peter Rabbit, the cartoon, that is also. Yes. <laughs> come out of the house. Okay. Round the tree. <laughs> Round the tree. Tell me, and if you're online via VVox, I don't want to know whether you were successful or not. I know I just showed you a video in Korean with no access to the subtitles. How did it feel to be set up for a real activity where you're really excited, looking forward to doing it? I do the activity, I give you the resource to do the activity, and it's almost impossible to engage with. How did it feel when you got that moment you thought, I can't do this because I can't engage with the materials you've given me. Uh, really annoying, Fran. Look <laughs> down. <laughs> and then you've missed it. Yeah. So you, you think you managed to do it by looking, but you were having to look away to do the knot, so you couldn't engage. And yeah, you don't speak Korean, so you can't listen to it while. So if there are any people that don't speak Korean as their native language they probably did okay at that it's not a great feeling is it when you get to that situation and everybody launches in and then you suddenly realize that the stuff you've been given and people asking you to succeed doesn't it prevents you it basically you've got an instant blocker to being able to learn i think probably i hand over to you now don't i so, yeah, yes, right. I will now confess, I've deliberately, we, we designed a bad learning experience and looked at it and <laughs> thought, how can we make it worse? Right, we can do that, we can do that. So this is, it's not the worst, worst we could have come up with. We wanted to deliberately put you in that situation where you're given something to do and then prevented from being able to do it. Right, so now we'd like to go back to the Miro board or alternative feedback mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> and actually here, I'll start checking in on Padlet to start well. listing out or calling at, but anyone who we've excluded by the way we've run. So in panel three, yeah. big groups, okay. micro groups, preferences, anything. Who did we exclude? And if you can think of anybody, who did we include? Yes. So that should and be. And just put post-it notes on the right hand panel for people that were excluded in that, that learning activity if they had to succeed at it, and people who were included. Do you need the? I just want to ask the URL again. Yeah, hang on. Get in there. Uh, I've got it on this one. It might be easiest to do it on this. Put the slides back on. Yeah, we can do it while people are working. Yeah. I'll open the. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good one. It's the one, isn't it? Yeah. I'll just, it's a QR code or link if you want it. Yeah, good one. The pressure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll jump across and put it on there in a minute. Um, there's a link to it on there. Uh, uh, the there bit thing on. So it's that QA dash out C. 23 dash UDL. Yeah. Is that a bowling? Might be. It's either a bowling or noose. I'm not sure I want to test it. <laughs> I'm just going to add the one about anxiety because I do like that one. Oh, 
looking at it. Can we, you can just, if you can't, you've just tied a bowling. Yay! <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Doing for time. But I'm going to add that one in. I'm delighted to see we have actually got some on the included side. It's clearly a more gifted group than we had before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not right at all. It's not working. Are you in successfully? Brilliant. Oh. Sure you, you might need to refresh it if you can. Oh, it looks like it's, it's not refreshing, is it? No. Try coming out and going back into it again, see if you can. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on to the next one, pick out a few. Yes, it was just everyone happy they've had long enough to yep. put a few points up. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most profound on here is in excluded, we've got me, <laughs> which I think is actually a kind of goes to the yeah. heart of the point is actually, um, and, and the reality is probably in the room, multiple me's, roughly about half. And probably I ended up with a bowling, but probably more by luck than judgment, if I'm being honest. Um, but yeah, let's, let's pick, pick out some of those. Um, uh, those with vertigo. Um, those online who uh, didn't hit, couldn't see how to spell Bolin to find it for themselves, because mm -hmm. Bolin is one of those words that doesn't quite sound like how it spelt how it sounds. Um, visual impairment, restricted mobility, neurodiverse. So the instructions again were, you know, effectively only given by us verbally, and then you're totally reliant on what we've given. And did you catch it all? Um, Absolutely. Uh, actually, I love, there's a bilingualness to this, which is you, you took the instructions from us in English and then the video was in Korean. So you actually needed to be bilingual, really, to be able to complete the exercise. Um, so, yeah, we've got dexterity. So we've got so many people we've excluded, mm. frankly, with probably the learning industry's most popular tool at the moment, which is video. Um, so then included, just, um, I think we've, you know, we've got uh, included Koreans, competitive people, sailors and climbers, I agree. Yeah. Um, it's basically people who already had some knowledge, isn't it? Former members of the Scouts. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but actually, all right, the, the, the post-its, if you turned, if instead of going by weight of post-its, we would have included a much smaller number of people than we excluded on that first <coughs> exercise. So we're going to try and learn from our mistakes, as all good people should, and we're going to have another go. Yeah. So scaling the heart heights part two, just to show so that we do... Not. Yeah, undo the knot. Very reluctantly in my case. <laughs> Part two, <coughs> you now have access to that video. And I can tell you, if you choose to use the video, you can switch on closed captions and you can translate them. So you can have, it will still be in Korean, but you can have closed captions in your first language. I've linked to a diagram, or you could look for your own diagram. And I've linked to the old classic Wikipedia, who has actually has some really good instructions on how to type a bowline. That's B-O-W-L-I-N-E for anybody that wants to look it up. 
And I'm going to give you probably another four minutes. If you've managed to tie it before, see if you can do it again. Have a look at the instructions. See if there's something that would have suited you better if you'd had it first time. If you haven't had a go before, dip in. If you're watching a video, please keep the volume down so we haven't got 25 videos playing in the room. People online, I'm going to check into VVox and see if there's any issues, but I think we're okay, and I'll check into Padlet as well. Have we got anything? Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting right. comment on um, VVox. I know there's good reason I cannot do the thing, but it does leave you feeling embarrassed. And how many learners would be ashamed, certainly in a, a new situation where they didn't know everybody, be ashamed to say that they couldn't use a piece of design? Yeah. All right. So three and a half minutes. Yeah. It's okay. Why am I not getting some of this? Somebody else said they felt like giving up. How often do we do that to learn without actually? <laughs> yeah. Did you write that? Yes, a little. <laughs> Rabbit yeah. comes out the hole. Frustrating. I'm enjoying reading these. All right. And for anybody that wants it, this is how you learned it last time, wasn't it? I wandered around the room tying a bowling. Would anybody like to watch me? I can't guarantee I'll get it right first time, but uh, as a former sailor, is everybody happy? Don't forget when you've managed to tie the knot, you can move your person to the top of the building ready to for when somebody hits start to look for the envelope. Hang on, this is where I put myself on the line for a second time. Anybody that's not looking at the thing, and I apologize to anybody I'm distracting by doing this. The story is the rabbit in the hole. You create a hole about halfway down your rope and you make sure there's a tree that is underneath the cross piece and you have a rabbit the rabbit goes up through the owl around the tree up through the owl around the tree hang on wrong rabbit i've got my tree upside down excuse me a moment so the rabbit goes up through the hole round the tree and back down the hole again grab your rabbit grab everything and you're ready to climb it's not both. If you do it slightly wrong, you can end up with a slip knot. This is not ideal if you're about to be load bearing your entire weight on it. So do make sure you can't move that it's a knot. Slip knot. I've got a slip knot. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, this is a ridiculous learning exercise, but it's just demonstrating how you can exclude somebody so simply without thinking. I think we probably are we up on time. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's okay. I've, I've put mattresses down. It's fine. You'll be okay. Just crash mats. <laughs> I also very keen on health and safety as well as you. Do. <laughs> yeah, give your knot to somebody else. Yeah. You're going to give your knot to me, aren't you? <laughs> so, if I go over to the Oculus building, I wonder how many people I've now got. up on top of the building. I've got quite a few up there now, look. Very well done. Yeah, we've got some I people up there. So we've got some people ready to go for the prize. You're still buying slip knots. You're not. <laughs> so, are we back over to yours? Yeah. Is it me now? Back to the inclusion and exclusion again. Can we move anybody? Right. So well done for a start. Well done. Right. So now the if we can go um, if we can go back to the previous board on inclusion, inclusion and, and exclusion. exclusion. So the green. Um, yeah. I will inclusion and exclusion. Bring everybody to me so that you can get there if that's okay. So three, two, one. You should now be over here. There we go. So the question now is. 
having done it the second time where we've given you choice and alternatives and also a second go practice, um, if you can move your, uh, either move your post-its or add to, add to Padlet, um, so move the existing post-its and add new ones. So did we include some other people or did we exclude some new people yeah. with the second time round? So now what's our current state having introduced choice with people that are excluded versus people who are included for being able to tie the knot? Yeah, I've... Mm. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. Hang on, I'll move it over. Oh, thank you very much. So actually we haven't got many people doing stuff in Padlet. No, we're okay, we're not. Um, we'll stick with Miro for now. There we go. So we are getting a move across from, so for some people, I mean, it's still not perfect. It's still not the ideal activity, but it's hopefully better than the first experience. So while you're moving those, while you're having a look at the post-it notes and included and excluded in looking to see if there's anybody that could now be included in being able to tie the knot, how did it feel to be given a choice and to actually have, be able to look at different ways of doing things and choose your own way of coming to that learning outcome? People online, if you want to drop something into VVox, People in the room, shout out and I'll repeat them. I'll unlock my laptop because no doubt it will have locked itself again. It's easier for me because I know how to manage choice and I know how to manage choices to make from my experience. Okay. That's a good point. So, yeah. So it was easier for you, but you know how to manage choice. So there's that other bit around being able to deal with choice. So if we suddenly introduce UDL, are our learners ready for it? Do we need to do some foundation work to give them the, the ability to cope with that option of choice? It's something, another element that needs to be considered. Yes, very good point. Okay, so not, not as many moving over as I thought would move. We've got more creative bunch, you see. Neurodiverse is a good point. Yeah. But again, we could build in more time, we could build in extra support, that sort of thing, to, to make sure that by, by design, somebody was able to, to take part. Somebody said the Wikipedia diagram was too complex. I know that static diagrams don't work for me. That's good. The video was still best format. That's interesting because somebody has chosen to go to the other language video because they still felt it was the best option. Captions didn't help. It was too distracting, but slowing the playback speed. So you've got this, you're suddenly given the tools for an existing learning asset. So can, when you host a video, has it got closed captions? Can you control the playback speed? Can you pause it? Can you restart it? Those sort of things. Whereas the first time I deliberately didn't give you the controls. Okay. I think things have stopped moving. Yeah. Um, did anyone finish the activity the second time very quickly and become bored? <laughs> Because that, I think, was the, you know, the second thing that we thought is if you do it the second time, some people need the second practice. But we also, one of the bits that we felt it could highlight is the, the, the need to give stretch and challenge for a, sub, a subset of learners. 
actually there weren't as many sailors in the room as we expected um and so if there had been sailors again we may well have had that that subset of people who go actually i i needed something else to go and do i needed advanced knots course um to, to yeah. follow so that was one of the things we we saw as a potential build to the way the activity works yeah brilliant so now we're gonna um go to our final section of the uh of, of today um no more not tying unless you want to tie may not see one <laughs> Um, there's actually thinking about the assessment and feedback aspects of, of, of this. So, you know, the third pillar of UDL. Um, and so, all right, bear with us. It, we are still keeping the theme going. It's still about the exercise we've done. But if, uh, as learning technologists and specialists and educators, um, the first question is, what are... We've put, I think we've pre-prepared two assessment commonly, yes. one commonly used assessment method and one less used assessment method. Well, um, unless we, you did a music degree like me. Yeah, well, you, unless you did music, <laughs> musical education. Um, <laughs> so what we'd like you to do is to help us come up with a variety of ways that you could assess that activity <laughs> and place them yeah. from, the absurd, from the wonderful to the absurd. Uh, now, I'm going to move a thousand word essay about tying a knot. It's a simple activity. You don't need to write in a thousand words. I'm going to move it down. There's possibly some variant of that that you might want to do. I would say if you want to assess whether or not somebody's tied a knot correctly, writing a song about it is probably about as bad as you go. So I'm going to put that somewhere east of the cross. Could be a sea shanty. It could be a sea shanty. Yeah. They don't do climbing shanties, do they? No. no. But, yeah. but these are just to show that there are some monumentally bad ways of assessing things that Sometimes you just look and think, why are we doing that way? And it's going back to the UDL and thinking, even if we've got a reasonably good way of assessing something, is it maybe time to go back and think about, could we do something different? Can we achieve what we need to do? Can we evidence what we need to evidence by doing it slightly differently? I love teach someone else to tie that knot. Short video is a good way of doing it. If you've got the wherewithal and you're comfortable doing videos, you could video yourself tying the knot as evidence that you're able to do it. I mean, obviously, again, it's a it's a theoretical exercise. We'd never be teaching people to tie knots necessarily, but it's just taking an activity and thinking, how can I assess that most effectively? Tie the knot under supervision. So yeah. Now that brings the next level, that blue one. You've done it twice now. Practice, working. <laughs> so we're getting much more into the realms of showing somebody else to do it, capturing evidence of you tying the knot. I like this one because not only are you testing that the person knows how to tie the knot by getting them to teach somebody else, but you could have taught me how to tie that knot, taught me wrong, and I'd have said, yes, I now know how to tie that knot. But you're then getting me to demonstrate that you've taught me correctly. So it's quite yeah. complex, but it, it just takes it to that next level. Is, is there some way we can improve what we do already? It's just that kind of approach. I think in, in particular, in the particular bit of one, the apprenticeship bit of, of, of our business, um, there's this real thing that's very similar to this, which is we're assessing for skills and competence. And the nice thing that's given to us is the opportunity that we don't have to specify for the learner how they prove that to us. Mm -hmm. The media is totally open to them um, and that they can build a portfolio that proves it in whichever way they choose and see fit. And and that's one of the great joys. You can put all of these up, but we don't have to specify them at the beginning for learners. We can say, we can give them suggestions and options and go, actually, any way that you might choose to show that you've done this for real in, in the real world at work is good. 
and I think that's one of the that's one of the places where you can really get into a really positive place on universal design for learning, which is the balance of choice and guidance. We can go, you might want to do it in one of these two ways, but anything else will be acceptable as long as it is your work and you can make it offensive. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the, for those online, the question was, have we uh, taken it further in learning design workshops and ABC? Yeah, actually, we do use ABC um, as one of our uh, methods. And, and actually, it's really helpful for that very, because it's so quick, ABC focused and gets things moving really quickly, is actually including this as part of the, the almost the stimulus, the input for ABC is going, actually, what we want to do in this is to consider UDL, consider inclusion right from the start of that abc rather than then trying to almost reverse engineer it back in when you're six you know six months further down the line so yeah no abc is a favorite model of us of ours as well yeah i'm a little worried about the risk of the um, most appropriate which is successfully abseiling back off the oculus after having tied the knot that's called high stakes assessment <laughs> Michael Go yeah. loves a bit of that. Yes. Yeah. Maybe he should. Would he like it? Would he like a go? <laughs> um, yeah. But then there's, there's so many. This is obviously a silly activity, but it's just modelling how it feels to not succeed. Which, to be honest, we're probably all quite used to succeeding or trying, and then we're used to dealing with failure and then trying other methods. But some of our learners may not. But looking at ways in which we can make it. So that it includes everybody, but also so that the learners have an equal chance of achieving at whatever level they need to. So we can introduce multiple levels of assessment, but can they all reach, achieve that A grade? Can they all achieve to the same level using the, the different methods that you're offering? So it's, it's just lots of different things. So really yeah. what we would, we didn't want to read the website to you today. We definitely haven't done that. We definitely haven't done that. But there's so much that you can just look into and the, the UDL guidelines just have a huge amount of content and about just doing a review of a piece of content or a review of a learning experience just to open up the UDL guidelines and pick an area and go through it and look through it. It's, it's a really valuable experience, something we like to do from time to time. Anyway, we do critique sessions and things. Indeed. Good. Yeah, so I think that brings us to the end of the planned activities. Um, I will sit on VVox if anybody wants to raise yeah. any questions or we can repeat questions in the room or I can dash over to you with my radio mic. Right. So any thoughts, I mean, comments, thoughts, questions at this point? Personal experiences? Those who come across UDL. Universal design is a way of thinking beyond you know, checklists. Yeah. It can cover you, it's been good since the 80s. Yeah. I think it's expandable into new things in the future. But still suggesting, I'm going to get this prize if I can get to the top of the building, it's going to be great to go. I wouldn't even think that. It mm -hmm. won't address structural inequalities. Mm -hmm. the, the, the challenges of the inequities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it can go so far, but get a bigger structure. Yeah. yeah yeah so the, the 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 basis of that is there are bigger structural inequalities that can't be addressed through udl but it can take you a long way there it can take you beyond checklists and into actually thinking about the person it's much more person-centered isn't it yeah and i think um so the question was about structural for those online was about um structural barriers and i i think I touched on it really briefly at the beginning. Those are generally things outside of the learning experience. They're about how how people are recruited onto a learning experience. What you know, everything from entry to attendance in person to those often are the bits which are whole institution challenges and um, and take an awful lot longer to mm -hmm. fix. But I think in some places they it, you know we've We've had some success with some of it, partly probably the help of it being an apprenticeship business and, and access and barriers being removed is kind of very, you know, very central to what it's about. Um, but they are harder and they do take longer. 
I'm going to. Um, Matt from Leeds, we have. Um, it's got to do with uh, some uh, variations of assessment to give us some choice. I think one of the biggest challenges within uh, our education institutions, we do still have a quality assurance policy framework that to see what it gets. You know, assessments are specified in advance, and there's a lot of very, very forward planning that you have to put in before you even get a really good understanding of even who your audience is, who your, who your learners might be. I mean, have you come up with any solutions to that? Really massive challenge. <laughs> yeah. How do you make sure to be inclusive, but also adhere to the credit framework and the, the policies that exist? Yeah, so, so we do run degree apprenticeships. Um, and we do those in partnership with universities. So we've got an extra layer of challenge, which is it's a partner. We don't, we don't even have control of our own regs and our own framework. Um, what's, the, what's the reality of the answer? The reality is we tried to do some of this in our first validation of the programme three years ago and sort of got told no, <laughs> to be fairly honest. I think that... Um, the helpful thing is in that kind of time, we've been able to, to pick some examples to build a bit more evidence. And the second time, we've just been able to go a little bit further, not, not as far as maybe we've done in other types of provision, but we've been able to introduce much more openness and choice. Um, and it's not totally open. It's not 100% do whatever you want because it still has the equivalences. So we've ended up with that being one of the practical things we've been able to do is going, you could do an, one, a thousand word essay or if equivalence would be this, if it was a video, we'd have it as an equivalence here. So we've done that as a way to, to just try and do parity, I guess, across different methods. And we've published those in module descriptors and in assessment briefs. Um, but yes, I do totally have the, the experience that you've had, which is it takes longer and it's harder for sure, <laughs> but not impossible. We've got a question in on Vivox. How do you deal with pushback of academics not showing interest in change to address inequalities? I'll let you have that one. Goodness me, what a question. <laughs> um, so I think, it, I, uh, how, do we, how do I solve pushback? <laughs> I think there's a, I, I, I guess our experience of this has been there's as a as a centralized learning team, which is probably slightly, again slightly different to universities where we are very centralized and we are able to have a bit more control. Um, is at times we we have been a bit more able in in our place to to just say this is the direction we're taking things. So we are going blended on this program, and that's a that's a decision and a direction, and we can go with it. I guess on other in other places. I think the best success we've had is where we've just started and done something with one person, even if they're just an early adopter. Um, and I remember us putting Miro in during the lockdown. We had a lot of people saying, this is going to be a disaster. I'm never using it. And, uh, and then we got, uh, what do we get? We got an original, we got an original pack of like 10 licenses um, and what we found is once we started putting in the choice and participation is suddenly we had um, a weird word of mouth phenomenon between our teachers and trainers. And we were being asked, I think we got, a we ended up with a hundred licenses within three months because suddenly there was something happening. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to tell you, I've solved how to resolve the partnership between subject matter experts and central learning teams. <laughs> I think the reality is it's a kind of forever problem that actually probably goes fairly to the heart of our jobs um, and just try, trying to find the ways and it's very individual, but particularly on UDL, to be more specific about UDL, I think um, we've done an awful lot in QA generally about inclusion and equity, a lot of it for staff actually, and it's been incredibly well received as a, an initiative. And I think that's been really helpful for us Gen, just with le, is most people who get into education are quite passionate about doing good for people. And that's the hook we always lead with is we want to be inclusive. We want to be a great educator. We want to include as many people as possible. And that's the hook we generally use with them and why probably UDL gets more traction than some other things we do. Yeah. 
I think learner voice has a lot of traction as well, doesn't it? It's, yeah. It does help. I'll come over with my radio, Mark, because you can be heard. Yeah. And um, when an institution has a, a EDI, equality, diversity, and inclusion strategy, does, does this help? Is it a leverage for delivering this kind of uh, workshop? Yeah, I mean, for sure, I think. And we found our EDI policy was a bit like where I started, where it was, you know, it was, it was quite narrow. And, and so we feel that UDL take really stretches beyond a kind of classic EDI policy and does a lot more than that. Um, we haven't had an Ofsted inspection for three years, but I'd, <laughs> I'd be very hopeful that this would be something that you we could take into an Ofsted inspection and be radically more, you know, beyond the kind of standard stuff they'd expect to see. But yeah, call us next year. I'll tell you how it's gone. <laughs> Jason. Thank you. Now I realise we're out of time. One more, no, please. So I, I, was, I was going to say, could a way of, of selling this would say that it could avoid some of the problems you have with individual adjustments for students, building yeah. in flexibility at the point where I am, my institution, in some courses, there is 40, 50, 60, 70 percent of students needing individual adjustments on yeah. assessment. Staff can't cope. No. This might be a way to avoid that. That's great. That's exactly. I mean, it's Including absolutely people. our experience. Yeah, that's a really good mm -hmm. point. It, it massively gets rid of these and, they, and those individual adjustments are normally done at the last minute as well and so it, yeah it's been really helpful for that brilliant thank you everyone thank yes, you thank for you being open and having a go